they were wrong about retail. I'm sorry. Some of the recommendations they made, we were doing our retail. So do I just say... Actually, some of the points that we didn't go over will be good fodder. I think we should say, is it like... We just disagree. We have acquisition experts. We have acquisition experts. We are doing what we're supposed to do. And we and we put and we responded. We had and we have she said we didn't have a um, she said we didn't have the right plan.
already. And apparently these went astray because they didn't get put to, straight up to the, the fix-it person. And as I understand it, one of the most important reforms is not the customer complaints were written to, I suppose you've heard of, but the right people in the structure did not hear these complaints. Is that so? At the right level, the level of
brother progressed me. I drive a Camry hybrid. I switch to Toyota very reluctantly because I wanted to buy an American car. And the Americans were not making hybrids almost at all or were so few that I went straight away Mr. Toyota's name on it. You don't want to claim it anymore? You are just claiming the car. No, no. I, I think it is American. This was the American's fault. No, 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 no. No, sir. And first of all, and also, now Camry Hybrid is, is not only on the recall list, but now. And I just want to find if you expect it ever to be on the recall list for any reason. I think you will be very safe in you know, driving the car. So that's why I'm saying it's a special performance car. We stand behind the Camry Hybrid, Mr. Toyota. said you intend to do. 
true because we are really going forward. I am trying, in, in my own question, to get some sense of where we need to have confidence in Toyota and where there's still some question. But in your uh, testimony, you, you say, and I'm quoting, I would like to point out here, this is page one of your testimony, that Toyota's priority has traditionally been the following. some of the concerns as people begin to speculate what indeed caused this and they come up with some kind of wild conclusion. But that black box uh, is critical. Now other manufacturers understand just how important it is to get to the cause of the accident for all concerned.
a request or some other government and authority request, we have made it open. What you came as if there was something that was so secret that even you had to be there in order for law enforcement and regulators to to, 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 to be there. I, mean, I, I just don't understand the difference. Indeed, let me make sure I understand what your testimony is. Are you saying that the company is redesigning the black box so that it can be readable by law enforcement, by safety investigators, and consumers? And only of them. The consumers. Not, yeah, it, it cannot be made available to anybody else unless there is a conscious demand, a demand now of the owner of the vehicle. You would not have to be, Toyota would not have to be checked in order for the black box to be checked. In fact, just like other manufacturers, you don't have to come to unlock the black box personally. I don't know that technical detail, Your Honor. Well, that's the whole point, sir. One second. That was very kind of you. I appreciate it. Sorry about that. Thank you all for your patience, forbearance. Uh, Mr. Turner, you had uh, wanted an opportunity to give a brief opening statement, and now might be a good time for that if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank you for your continued focus and, and effort here, and I also want to thank Jane Harmon for her uh, career-long focus on, on this. That we've been um, had uh, I've had the fortune to work with Jane on a number of issues. Um, the, um, it's, as some of you know, my initial interest in this came about by the unfortunate uh, uh, murder of Maria Lauterbach, uh, who was from my community. Uh, that brought to light uh, several issues as to how um, rapes are handled, both in the report and in uh, with the victim. Um, so I have worked with a number of members on issues where we've tried to, fi to find ways to change uh, both laws and to work with DOD on ways that we can enhance the protection to victims and also find ways to, um, to provide them additional support. Um, this report, I think, is, is an excellent uh, report for a basis to begin the process of, of looking at additional ways that we can support victims. Um, and, and I want to focus on one aspect of, of um, an item that I know is important to all of you, and that is the issue of culture. Um, <clears throat> the, um, almost in every sexual assault hearing uh, that I go to, I read this provision of an answer that I got as a response to questions that I had submitted concerning Maria Lauterbach. Um, uh, General Kramlich of the U.S. Marine Corps was responding to a series of questions that I had posed with respect to the Maria Lauterbach uh, case um, and a number of statements that were made through DOD and through the Marines that I found troubling. Uh, one of those was that they had indicated that they had no notice that Maria Lauterbach might be at risk because there had been no violence that had been alleged. Uh, in, uh, in the allegations of what had occurred to her. So I, I wrote uh, the question of, doesn't a rape accusation inherently contain an element of force or threat? And the answer that I got back was in May 2007, 
uh, when uh, Lauterbach formally made allegations of rape against Lorian. Uh, the command was only made aware of two reported sexual encounters, one sexual encounter characterized as consensual by Lauterbach and the other alleged to be rape. Uh, Lauterbach never alleged any violence or threat of violence in either sexual encounter. Now, uh, the reason why I read that in every hearing, because when we have the issue of culture, uh, I would hope that throughout DOD, no one would ever write again that any sexual assault could not have uh, an allegation of violence or threat of violence, because as we all know, it's inherent in, the, uh, in a sexual assault itself. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for bringing uh, the highlight to this and know that we all have a lot of work to do and we appreciate the work that, that you all are undertaking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin the questioning if uh, nobody has any objection to that. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Whitley, back in August of 2008, uh, we had a report from the General Accountability Office which made nine recommendations to improve the Department's sexual assault prevention and response programs. Today's report from the GAO states that you've implemented only four of those recommendations, and two of those four were actually addressed by non-SAPRO task forces. So can you explain to us why some 18 months later, since the, that report comes out, uh, such a small percentage of those nine remaining objectives have been dealt with effectively? We may have actually addressed more since then. I could probably answer the question better if we talk specific recommendations. Um, I know one thing that was of particular interest to you, sir, was the oversight framework and the strategic plan. Um, we have completed that. Uh, as I did take it for your suggestion to Ms. Farrell and give her a briefing on it. They made suggestions. I went back and took their edits and their suggestions. Um, and that has been completed and we've already begun some implementation. We're still waiting for it to be signed out by the new undersecretary. Well, Ms. Farrell, of the five that were unaddressed at all, your recommendations, can you prioritize those for us? Certainly, I would like to focus on the uh, oversight plan and I, we do appreciate the cooperation that we receive from DOD by sharing the draft framework with us during our review that so that we could see it and analyze it and comment on it. And our rec they should be given credit for laying a foundation for their oversight framework, uh, which is quite a challenge. But that oversight framework, strategic plan, whatever you want to call it, uh, based on our body of work looking at uh, best practices of successful organizations that are results oriented, uh, there are identifiable key elements that you'd want to see in the oversight framework, which we, met, we noted in the August 2008 report. At a minimum, you want clear goals, objectives, milestones, and performance measures. And uh, performance measures are very key for that roadmap. As I mentioned in the opening, uh, performance measures are necessary to gauge where you are as you're headed toward your goal. And to measure and make a course direct change if necessary. And that is one of the key elements that's missing in that oversight framework is, is the performance measurement. Another that uh, we uh, discussed with uh, uh, DOD uh, back in November before we sent the uh, draft report over with the recommendations that we'd like to see is uh, once you have the performance measures, you need strategies of what you're gonna do with the results once you get them in order to make those course corrections. Another element we'd like to see is tying the program objectives with, with budget priorities, very key, because that will help DOD to support uh, justification for any resources that they need, whether it's personnel or funding. And lastly, there were three documents that DOD provided to us to our, during the review, and Sometimes you'll have one comprehensive strategic plan. Sometimes there's multiple documents. That's fine. We do not take issue with how many documents they have that comprise their strategic framework. But the three documents provided to us were difficult to tell how they did complement each other. Uh, two of the documents had five objectives that did match up. But then the oversight framework that they discussed with us and provided with us that was responding to our recommendation had nine improvement initiatives that we could not correlate back. Uh, so we still, it's not clear to us uh, what that oversight framework that they provided to us, where that fit with the other documents that comprise their strategic planning. 
Hi, Dr. Dr. Whitley, is, is that helpful? Is that something you can work with uh, Ms. Farrell and, and sort of correct? Absolutely. We did take the plan back after my meeting with her, and we developed a user guide. We also have requirements in the department to have a strategic plan, and it would be confusing to someone um, looking at the three documents. We have to align ours with uh, the personnel and readiness plan and the secretary's plan, and we also had to go back and refit all of that. Then the oversight framework, we saw that as we hung that, if you will, on our strategic plan and saw that as part of our oversight. We see our role as prevention, um, victim care and response, and then our role as system accountability, and that's where we hung the framework. I think now we've made it more user-friendly, and we've also developed measures. One of the things that we talked about at the last hearing, um, our civilian and federal partners all struggle with finding the best measures for sexual assault. Because as you know, you can't use reports because it's so underreported. So we are looking at ways now to measure prevention and response, and we were able to get uh, at least four or five measures in the PNR strat plan. And we're going to measure awareness, we're going to measure victim satisfaction, and we are developing surveys. And, and it's a challenge, and there are not very many models out there. I mean, it seems to me that you have a good working relationship with GAO, and I, and I appreciate that, and so I'm trusting that you'll be able to continue that and, and resolve those issues. I think they provide value added to you and, and a resource for you. So uh, I appreciate that you are working with them and, and being open about it, and we'll expect that those things will be resolved. Ms. McGinn, just before my time is up, um, how are you aligning the resources, the money, uh, to this so people know that you were serious about it and that it's going to get funded appropriately? And two, uh, the general made a good point. Uh, are you going to be able at the, at the uh, Department of Defense to undertake a review of the guard and reserves at the state and um, unit level? We have um, just recently, I think it was last year, established program element codes. Uh, and into those program element codes, the services put, military services put their money that they have dedicated to this program so that we have visibility over it um, and that we can see that it's in there and it's not being cut or it's growing or whatever. And I think in FY10 there's about $110 million so far uh, that the services had identified. Um, in addition to that, we have um, succeeded in getting additional funding for the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office, um, $20 million, um, to help with our outreach efforts, our oversight efforts with the development of the database and those kinds of things. So we are, one, we're watching the money and two, we're actively engaging in the budget process to try to find more money um, where necessary for it. Um, and we absolutely believe we need to look harder at the Garden Reserve. Um, and we're looking at ways that we might do that. We do have a yellow ribbon program, as you know, that works with the Garden Reserve and we are involving the Garden Reserve in our various oversight uh, committees. So we, ad we agree with that recommendation. And we'll take action on that. Blake. Thank you. Uh, Brigadier General Dunbar, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that things were improving, and I, I just wasn't quite clear as to if you're referring to uh, fewer incidents of abuse um, and how would that be measured or the, the plan uh, being implemented, uh, that, that is improving in speed, or can you qualify that, that statement? And maybe I heard it wrong, I, I, but, yes, but you mentioned something like that. In terms of improving, what I'm referring to is that uh, the program focus, uh, certainly within the services, the leadership attention that is being given to it from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the service secretaries and the service chiefs, um, down to, in some locations, not universally all locations, unit commander involvement in addressing the issue. Uh, from the SAPRO standpoint, I think, you know, since 2005, establishing restricted reporting, uh, which, um, you know, I think a lot of commanders were very reluctant to embrace. Uh, now many people are seeing that as very good because more victims are coming forward, uh, those victims who wouldn't have come forward had they not had that restricted reporting option. And so I think awareness is growing and appreciation for a lot of the mechanisms, uh, thanks to Congress's oversight and thanks to just the continued emphasis uh, we are having uh, folks come on board, um, people are accepting the fact that sexual assault does occur within the military services and it needs to be addressed. So from a program standpoint, uh, response has increased, uh, you know, even in the prevention area, which we were initially finding lacking, uh, the fact that uh, the DOD SAPRO office is really working the bystander intervention, all the services are addressing that, uh, that is positive progress. But at the same time, you know, one of the concerns that we have is that uh, bystander intervention is not the be-all, end-all in terms of a comprehensive prevention strategy and that more needs to be done. 
So progress, but still more to be done. And somebody uh, tell me over the past, say, two years, has uh, the uh, reported cases of sexual abuse gone up or down? We've had approximately 3,000 reports each year. And we will be releasing our FY09 report on 15 March, and um, we already know the numbers have gone up slightly. We hope we, we want people to report. That's our uh, goal. And, and that's, that's I guess, my, my next question is uh, certainly the uh, recommendations include you know, increased awareness and education, and, and with that comes uh, in reporting requirements, or not requirements, but uh, structures that people are more comfortable with. Are they recognizing that, that, that part of improvement is getting more people to come forward? Um, are there metrics then to, to gauge whether we're improving or not in terms of incidents of sexual abuse, uh, independent of uh, how many are reported? We're developing um, a survey with the Defense Manpower Data Center to, to ask people on a survey if they've experienced unwanted sexual contact and if they've reported. Um, one statistic I do have, since we've had uh, restricted reporting, it was the middle of um, June 2005, we've had over 2,600 people use the restricted option reporting. So that is data that tells me that that's something that we should continue and that I, that is a good option for us in reducing barriers to reporting. And we are working on other ways to measure the prevalence of sexual assault. Uh, even in society, statistics show us that less than 18 to 20 percent, uh, only about 18 to 20 percent of victims report to an authority, so it's vastly underreported. So what we're doing in our program is we're, we're trying to remove the barriers that keep people from coming forward and uh, to try to build climates of confidence and to reduce stigma. And stigma is also a big, I mean, we want to reduce stigma for um, any type of um, mental health that people are seeking. Thank you. Mr. Turner, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> after, um, after you all testify, uh, there will be a gentleman who's, who's testifying uh, whose name is Merle Wilberding, who's an attorney uh, who has worked with the Lauterbach family uh, and has worked with my office on some of the legislation that, that we've sponsored um, on issues such as military protective orders, ensuring that they don't expire and also that um, so local jurisdictions are notified because actually in, in her case uh, the local jurisdiction did not know that a military protective order had been, been put in place and we changed that in legislation with the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, he, um, in addition to representing them, I, I just wanted to give you one, one fact about his, his legal career. As an Army JAG captain, he was assigned the responsibility to represent the government in the Lieutenant Cali appeal of his conviction in the infamous Mylay massacre. So he has a little bit of information on the inside as it, in addition to, um, to representing this family. And in his testimony, one of the things he's going to highlight is the issue of the victim advocates. And um, he's going to lay out the case of, of really how, how people are, feel, um, whether or not that system is, is responsive. And then he has a recommendation that perhaps victim advocates uh, need to uh, establish a line of authority outside the base chain of command. Um, I wondered if you all might comment on that, having looked at the issue through, um, through your task force. Um, I, that's not, uh, not something that you've recommended, but it um, would be interested to get your thoughts on that. General Dunbar, why don't we start with you? Congressman Turner, one of the things that we did recommend was uh, to provide um, uh, some confidentiality uh, with the victim advocates um, because uh, in the statistics that we saw approximately 78 percent of, uh, of attorneys who were prosecuting cases uh, had indicated that they would or in the defense would uh, subpoena uh, victim advocate records and so uh, when you know that you have victims who are uh, who we tell to go to a victim advocate to seek the care um, and yet at the same time uh, know that they're vulnerable to having whatever they disclose uh, be used against them. Um, that is not what we would consider to be uh, providing adequate victim support. We do think that uh, you can establish a system that allows the uh, victim advocates to have that confidentiality and still have them uh, within the, uh, the military structure as opposed to going outside of a, a military reporting chain. Um, so 
in answer to your question, we did not explore specifically um, the proposal that you have outlined, um, but we recognize the importance of victim advocates and the care that they provide and realize that we have a deficiency as it currently is set up. Do you have an opinion on that issue, on his recommendation? Well, sir, as I said, I, I do believe that uh, we can cure the issue without having to have the victim advocates report outside the, the chain of command. There are a variety of, um, of options, I think, that exist. Um, anyone else wish to comment on, on the issue of the chain of command? If I could. Yes. Um, I think we want commanders to be involved and to be proactive and to be advocates and to help solve these problems. And I think they're could be a little bit of danger taking this outside the chain of command, that you would create a space where the commander wouldn't know what was going on, would not be involved, and would set up a um, almost a, a conflicting relationship. So I would just caution that we, I think we want commanders, um, as I said, to be involved in this process and to understand their responsibilities and to, and to respond correctly. So. If I could just add, I think, you know, the issue, and especially in our review as we looked at restricted reporting, uh, we have found that uh, the commanders, if they know that uh, certain restrictions exist, uh, they respect those restrictions. And so uh, whether it is within the chain of command, uh, if a victim advocate is granted confidentiality, um, I think a commander would jeopardize his or her position by trying to pry information out of uh, the victim advocate. Uh, and so that's, that's principally why I think that we have options that we can work with then. If I may weigh in on this too, uh, we found one of the issues, uh, access to a commander is critical for the health of the program. <coughs> and so with the sexual assault response coordinators, when they, when they had that access with their commanders and were able to, to voice their concerns and bring issues before them, uh, we felt that they were very successful in what they were trying to do when they had two or three levels of bureaucracy that they had to deal with, their effectiveness as response coordinators was significantly diminished. That's why the use of contractors as sexual assault response coordinators was one of our recommendations. We think that access is critical, and uh, we think it's, 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 it's not only important to the, to the program, but as many people have mentioned, the commander sets the tone, and the commander really needs to know what's going on in his or her command. Well, and, and uh, with the chairman's indulgence, I mean, the reason why I find it, it a, um, an important recommendation is because, you know, in the military, the situation is so unique in that the individual who is the victim uh, has, you know, the, the military, in effect, has a custodial relationship with them where they, they can't get up and leave. Uh, they're told where they're there to be. You, you don't have the same um, freedom of movement that you would have if you were a victim in, in the private sector. And then to have what is ultimately up the chain of command, your boss, having the same people reporting to you that are supposed to be aiding you, the, it, the inherent conflicts of interest are just obvious as to how they, they could arise. And so I, I do think it's something for us to have more discussion on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Harmon, we want to welcome you to the subcommittee and thank you for your interest in this subject and your leadership on it. And uh, welcome you to uh, give us uh, five minutes of question, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the fact that this uh, subcommittee on a bipartisan basis has held four hearings on this subject, uh, there is intense concern from Congress about what I would call an epidemic of assault and rape in the military, which I view as both a moral problem and a force protection problem. Uh, and it, at a time when the public looks at Congress and thinks we can't do anything together, I hope everyone was listening up. I think uh, both sides of the aisle on this committee are, are equally concerned. And I, I, I know, Mike, that the Lauterbach family is very lucky to have you as their Representative, you have been passionate about this issue, which is something we all need to be. Uh, on that point, only one of you, uh, and that was Dr. Whitley, uh, mentioned in personal terms the toll that rape and assault takes on people. Uh, Dr. Whitley said uh, it changes a, human's be a human being's life forever, uh, and it may terminate some human being's life in the case of uh, Maria Lauterbach. So I think we have to keep that in mind. It's not just a question of statistics and strategies and milestones and goals. Uh, this is a, a, a deeply personal issue. It's a violation of one's uh, physical space. And uh, as uh, guess the only woman member sitting up here, uh, I, I want to say how strongly I feel about this and how urgently we have to fix this. And, and I guess my, my message and my questions today are 
are, are, are focused on prevention. Uh, it's, it's good to, you, you've all heard me say this in the past, it's good to be better uh, at response and better at uh, victim care. Uh, I applaud you for trying to do that. And it's good to uh, co coordinate the statistics and create a, a, a more comfort for victims to come forward. All of that's important. But wouldn't it be better if we didn't have victims? I mean, let's get a sense of the proportion of this. I, I uh, in August 2007, went to the West Los Angeles VA where there is a women's clinic. And I was blown away to hear that 41% of the female veterans they see are victims of military sexual trauma and 29% were raped. Now this isn't a scientific survey, but I'm sure those are accurate figures for three years ago in the West LA VA. And generalizing this to the country gets me to the, my little sound bite, which is a woman is more likely to be uh, raped in the military than killed by, by a fellow soldier than killed by enemy fire. So my question to you and I, is, Shouldn't we be doing more about prevention? I welcome your response, each of you. And specifically, shouldn't we uh, be doing more of what the Army is doing with its I Am Strong campaign by hiring uh, outside uh, investigators and prosecutors to teach a team of 300, I understand, prosecutors in the Army to do a better job of uh, investigating and prosecuting uh, these uh, rapes and assaults, so it sends a strong message to people that you cross a red line and uh, e either as a perpetrator or as someone in the chain of command, and you pay a big penalty. Ms. Farrell? Thank you. Uh, I would like to note regarding that first part, our report does note that not only does sexual assault uh, have implications for the individual, but for the family, the friends, the colleagues, the whole Absolutely. community, besides the unique impact, obviously, on the military that we were t discussing earlier. Regarding prevention, shouldn't that be important? I, I believe all three ways. Shouldn't legs. it be more important, well, more emphasized? It should be, it is a prevention, response, and resolution. So I think there has to be emphasis on all three. As you know, uh, after SAPRO was developed and established, rather, uh, the emphasis was really more on response, taking care of the victims was driving. And it's just, I think, in the last year, and of course DOD can speak to this more, where they've gotten more of a handle on the prevention. And that's what we're looking for, again, in the strategy of what are the clear goals of what you're trying to accomplish. And, and by having a very clear goal on prevention and how you're going to get there, maybe we will see this actually the numbers go down. Mr. Chairman, could others just answer my question? I know my time is expiring. Um, thank you always for the support you've given this program, Ms. Harmon. Uh, one of the things I know the Army came out with their I Am Strong campaign and um, the department has a DOD-wide strategy. We work very closely with the Center for Disease Control and use their spectrum of prevention, which tells us you have to work the strategy at every level from the individual all the way up to policies and laws. And we also work with the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. And each of the services, in fact, the Navy and the Air Force ha each held summits uh, just a few months ago. They brought in their highest levels of leadership. And I can tell you in talking with some of the generals that were there and the leaders, they are all on board. And I think we have a very strong prevention campaign and strategy in all of the services now. If I could add, I had noted that uh, there needs to be a greater emphasis on prevention, and uh, having the strategy is great. Uh, the bystander intervention uh, is one facet of it, uh, but it also includes the community awareness and, and physical safety. For instance, when we were over in the AOR, how you actually set up uh, a, a location, where you put the uh, female latrine, uh, where you site the female tents. Um, sometimes we have the cultural issues of this is the way it's always been done before. Uh, likewise, even when you are going through uh, the dormitory or the barracks areas, basic security measures and some of the newer facilities you find uh, that you've got um, the, the video cameras, uh, surveillance cameras uh, that are set up. Um, it is, uh, a lot of it is driven by culture and the more awareness that we have in addressing the issues, uh, the greater you can uh, provide prevention at basic levels. And uh, that the key to all this is leadership involvement. Uh, the senior leadership of the services, no doubt, are all engaged. Uh, as I mentioned, the chairman is engaged. 
Uh, but that needs to populate down to unit commanders who have to understand that they have to be out front addressing this issue on a regular basis and have candid discussions of the fact that sexual assault is not tolerated. And even those things on a continuum to include sexual harassment, that those behaviors are not uh, going to be accepted within service in the armed forces. Could I just add one thing about culture? Because the military culture is created and we take young people off the streets of America and we send them to basic training and we turn them into soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And while it's a more long-term solution, if we look to what we already know in terms of how to create soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, couldn't we also look to how we change attitudes and how we inculcate this as a cultural issue? And I would just like to note, I was reviewing service programs in preparation for this. And I was struck by the fact that the Army, um, for their new recruits, has now got um, the new recruits receive sexual assault training uh, during their reception, during the first week of basic training, just prior to their first overnight pass, and upon advanced individual training entrance. So that kind of emphasis, I think, at the basic training uh, level, I think would go a long way for us. Thank you. If I may, uh, you have highlighted what was for us as a task force one of the most critical recommendations, that we have a comprehensive prevention strategy, cross-service, that's, that's given a strategic leadership by the SAFRA office, which has the measurements in there to know whether it's working or not, to give us the granularity to be able to identify trends, to see whether or not it is in fact doing what it's supposed to do. But one of the other recommendations which ties into it is the fact that we don't feel the DOD can do this alone. If we're going to develop a truly effective, comprehensive prevention strategy, we need to partner with our national allies in this effort, uh, with academia, with the national alliances against rape and, 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 and crimes against women. We need to partner with these experts throughout the country so that we can move forward with a comprehensive prevention strategy ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Thank all of you. Uh, I think I'm going to give people an opportunity to just to ask another question or two if they have it before we let you all go. And, and when you talked about culture, uh, Ms. McGinn, I was thinking what we had uh, listened to at the last hearing was about a connection by one of the witnesses, that a connection between the ban on women in ground combat and sexual assault. Uh, specifically, that witness testified that the ban sends a signal from the top that women are second-class soldiers and thus inferior to male soldiers. And the inferiority perpetuates an antagonistic view of women that helps create a culture that is conducive to sexual assault. Do you want to reflect on that for us, whether, whether you think that's true or not, and what we might do about it if it is? I haven't really given that any thought. I do know that, and I think it was in the last task force report on the academies that the, that the and I, I saw can correct me, the task force noted that at the academies, the percentage of women that you had um, was made a difference in terms of the attitudes and the way that people were treated. Uh, that there needed to be kind of a critical mass of women there. Um, I don't know that the ban necessarily creates an issue for us. I hadn't really thought that through. Can we provide that testimony for you so, you, so maybe you can take a look at it and, and let us know what you think okay, about it at some point fine. in time? And, and I don't want to hit you unfairly, but it struck me when you were saying that it tied in right. on that. Mr. Height, you've been very good to sit there uh, throughout this whole hearing. I, I do want to ask you to weigh in on, on terms of data collection and where you think we're at on that, what needs to be done to make sure we're at the points we need to be. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Um, for any large database like this, it's, it should be viewed as a process. It's, something, it's a journey that you have to uh, walk down. And so I would say at this juncture that uh, the department is at the end of the beginning of the process. There are some things that have been done. Uh, give them credit for that. But there really is a lot that still remains to be done. And uh, while I'm cautiously optimistic going forward, uh, in, in part because the department agreed with the recommendations we laid out, which was things that needed to be done uh, going forward, I do have some doubts. And some of those doubts um, surround uh, what I believe is um, uh, the need for uh, perhaps more staffing in the program office that's devoted to the acquisition uh, and the implementation of this database and to, to make sure that we're not too reliant on contractors to do that work for us. Thank you very much. Uh, then there's finally the, uh, the last question I had on this was uh, priorities uh, for the general and the admiral to address. I, I think you mentioned one of them, prevention. Is there 
amongst the many recommendations that you made to improve the prevention and, uh, and response program, is there another priority that you think needs attention right away and, and to a better degree than it's getting now? We've already discussed the, the data. We absolutely uh, believe that the, the database and the tracking for accountability is essential in order to be able to do trend analysis to further address the issue. Uh, without that, uh, we continue to um, just kind of chase tails around the table. Great. Mr. Flake, you have any questions? I'll just yield my time to Mr. Turner. I know he's been Mr. Turner. On this a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> In, in looking to the report, General uh, Dunbar, you and I spoke about the issue that um, there are a number of recommendations in it that are for congressional action. Uh, as you know, the National Defense Authorization Act will be moving here in the next couple of months. Um, Jane Harmon and I last year got a f number of things that were in it. Um, you know, obviously, the report, uh, we can peruse through it and pick out those things that, uh, uh, that are highlighted as congressional action to take action, but I wondered if uh, DOD, in response to the report, had plans on providing us um, the, uh, the legislative direction in some of the areas that, that you're making uh, a, um, a suggestion that Congress take action. Uh, is that on your to-do list, uh, or will you be leaving it to us to go through the report and begin to initiate those items? Congressman Turner, we provided those recommendations to the Department of Defense and the Secretary of Defense, uh, and the military services are looking at that, and uh, they will be providing, Sec Secretary of Defense, I believe on the 1st of March, will be providing uh, the report with his comments. Uh, so we will leave it up to the Department of Defense. The task force, for the most part, has concluded its review uh, in providing the report to the Secretary of Defense. Ms. McGinn, are you aware of, of whether or not, I mean, they had some very specific recommendations when we met in my office, I, I saw the urgency of it and was saying, you know, gosh, we need to, need to get on these. Uh, as you know, the, the bill will be moving in the next couple of months. Are, are you aware of whether or not um, in, I wouldn't want to miss a whole year uh, that DOD has it on its agenda to get those items to us? If I'm not mistaken, I think in the process right now, we have been working with the military departments, looking at all of the recommendations of the task force and sorting out an overall DOD response <coughs> because not everybody agrees with everything. And so our job is to adjudicate that and make it a consolidated position for the secretary. As we do that, if we see things that need legislative action, um, we can certainly formulate them for legislative action. I appreciate your commitment on that because it, the, um, I, I would, on the ones that you agree with that are in the report, we should move now. Um, and uh, the, uh, rather than our just taking them and, and putting them forward, and then waiting for a response, it would be great if we could work together on that. Just to be honest with you, our process might take longer than that, the process, the bureaucratic process in the building. So well, and that's we'll the information I needed to know, because if we need to start the process without a DOD, we certainly have the report, and, and I can uh, get with uh, right. members, including Jane, to see what items that, that she sees that are important that we might need to move forward. Thank you, Ms. Hammond. Do you have an additional question or two, Your Honor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does well, I assume your committee I'm member? Ms. Spear, if you're done, and that she's oh. next and final here. Well, if if I would, uh, you got to go deal with it. to you first. If I got to go you now. You have it. Go with it. And okay. Go Spear. Okay. Two things. First, uh, the comment on leadership. Uh, I surely agree. I have spoken personally to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs about speaking out on this issue. Uh, we all know that "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" has gotten a lot of airtime lately. I personally hope we repeal that policy. But they have spoken out on that issue, and I would just use my, my time to urge them to speak out on, on this very compelling issue. But here's my question. In the, uh, I understand in, in the new GAO report you have findings, for example, that say victims don't seek uh, prosecutions for fear of a humiliating public trial, and you also say that uh, half the women who do not report rape or sexual assault do so for fear of retaliation. There are remedies for these things. For example, you could recommend uh, um, some, some way to close the trial so it would not be publicly humiliating, or you could recommend um, th that, that uh, people uh, have an easier time to uh, seek a base transfer in the case of those who, uh, who worry that they would be uh, retaliated against. That was one of the issues in the Lauterbach problem. Um, why, don't you make, why didn't you make those recommendations? I think this is the uh, task force report. I see. Not okay. To be Excuse me. The, I uh, did GAO confuse it with yours. Report. Defense task force. You folks in the middle. Why didn't you make those recommendations? I, 
I think, uh, Congresswoman, all the, 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 the many areas that we looked at, uh, we, uh, we understood the role of leadership. We understood the, uh, w when we went around and we interviewed all the, uh, all the commanders and especially the courts martial convening authorities in every place, and if you saw the extensive list of visitations that we did. Yeah. Uh, uh, we looked at whether or not they aggressively addressed the issue of sexual assault and how aggressively they prosecuted any sort of uh, concerns with that arose within their commands. And this, this, the feeling that we got as a, as a task force was that the majority, the major majority of commanders and courts martial convening authorities not only take this seriously, but they're out aggressively uh, uh, prosecuting where they can with the advice of counsel. Uh, as far as the safety issues, we have specific recommendations for the safety, uh, the safety of victims, and uh, we we were very very concerned about the way victims were treated once they reported to their command, mm -hmm. and even those that in a restricted way reported to the chaplain or, or someone else. We we as as the general mentioned, we were very concerned about the safety and security issues. We even went to the in, into the into the uh, the barracks. And in the dormitories of the Air Force, we went to see about the, the security issues that were there and how were people handled, how were they processed, how were they tended to uh, when, whenever they reported uh, an, an incident of sexual assault. So that was our f part of our focus, a very important part of our focus, and our recommendations, I think, did address some of those issues. Well, let me just conclude, Mr. Chairman, that I, I think the rate of prosecutions lags way behind civil society, and I think there's much more to do, and part of it is a training issue for prosecutors, and again, I think the Army offers the best example for what needs to be done there, and on the safety issue, there are some specific recommendations that I, I think uh, could have been in your report and weren't, um, for example, facilitating base transfer. Uh, which would encourage a lot of women to come forward who would otherwise be afraid to do so. And, and, and if they did so, in the case of Lauterbach, would, would have a horrible outcome. So I, I just I think there's more to do, and I think it needs to focus around prevention much more than just response. And we would get a lot farther, a lot faster with this epidemic uh, among those who step forward to protect our country and who, in fact, we don't protect well enough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity thank you, Ms. to be Holland. here. We appreciate your interest and concern. The gentleman from California, Ms. Spear, we thank you for your interest and for your leadership on this issue. We're happy you could join us here today. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a, a question to the task force. My understanding is that in 2008 there were 2,265 unrestricted reports that were filed. Of those reports, how many of them um, then were f pursued as full criminal investigations and court martials. Congresswoman, I believe that actually uh, the SAPRO office is better suited because they have the data for that to answer the question. Right. I think we have the report for this. And if there were 2,389 investigations on reports made in this and prior years, and you know we collect data by fiscal year, but certainly if a, an assault occurs in September, for example, that case is not it could be um, would be may not be completed by then. But there were 2,763 subjects. 592 were pending deposition, disposition, 136 subjects were civilians or foreign nationals not subject to the UCMJ, so the commander couldn't take action. There were 129 subjects that were unidentified. Uh, there were 1,074 subjects that had cases that were unsubstantiated, unfounded, lacked sufficient evidence, or involved a victim that recanted or a subject that died. There were 1,339 subjects that were referred by commanders for the following actions. There were 317 referred for courts martial, 247 for non-judicial punishment, and 268 administrative actions or discharges. All right. If, if I understand this correctly, over half of the cases 
for just about half of the cases were not dealt with. You said 1,074 because of lack of evidence or recanting or the like. So half of those, half of those people who had the guts to come forward were dismissed for whatever reasons, correct? And then of the remaining, you have 317 that were court martials of that original 2,300 figure and 247 that had some kind of um, administrative action taken. So I'm in the service. I know those figures. What's the likelihood of me reporting a second time when of those who had the guts to report end up seeing that half of them are thrown out? Now, I don't know the, the, the circumstances under what, when they were or how they were thrown out, but those numbers are chilling. And if, in fact, there are so many more that go unreported for the very reason that they're concerned about ostracism or uh, retaliation, we've got a bigger problem than one might suspect. Um, well, there's another point that we have six different categories of sexual assault in the UCMJ, from the least egregious, which would be indecent touching, to uh, aggravated assault or rape. So there's a wide variety of sexual assault. It's not just rape. But what you were well, talking wait a about. With all due respect, uh -huh. um, unwelcome touching to me is an assault. Mm -hmm. And I think for most women, it would be an assault. So to somehow diminish them because there are, th there are levels of gravity is not really comforting. Uh, and well, the commander does have the discretion to uh, award a punishment that he feels, um, that feels fits the crime, if you will. And we do provide synopses in our annual report, which describes each of these cases. And I don't think you'll get any of us disagreeing with you. And we know we can do better. And just as Ms. Harmon said, part of her interest um, and her relationship with the former Secretary of the Army, uh, we are looking closer at how to train trial counsel. And we actually just got the funding to train prosecutors and investigators uh, so that we can improve the process. But I, I wanted to comment on something. You used the word chilling, and there is something in the literature called the chilling effect. And if you do send a case to courts martial and that person gets off. By the time it gets back to the people in the unit or the people in the academy, they think that usually the perception is the victim lied, or um, but and it does it has a tremendous effect when that happens. So I, I would suggest a couple things. One is there's got to be a way to you know videotape a victim and change their voice so that they aren't necessarily specifically identifiable. Um, two. Um, I think that there should be a zero tolerance policy that is communicated everywhere um, that, and then is reflected in, in what actually takes place. And third, I think there should be some kind of a review of those women who come forward and who make a complaint. There is a court martial. The individual uh, perpetrator is court martialed. What then happens to the victim in their professional career? I'd like to tra see us track them to see what is their life like afterwards. Because if their life is, for all intents and purposes, professionally destroyed, that sends us yet another message of why we're not getting people coming forward. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our questioning of this panel. I, I just want to take one moment to thank our friends from the General Accountability Office. You've been steadfast and incredibly helpful on this, and I suspect your work isn't done. At some point, we may want you to sort of look at this again for us or whatever, but I, w I just want to thank you for, for the great work that you've done. Uh, Dr. Iacello and uh, General Dunbar, thank you for your service generally to the country or whatever, but for specifically on this task force. Uh, from I understand from your testimony that you think you're done now, and, and you're, is that complete? You're complete your responsibilities on this. So I'm sure uh, that you're on to other things or whatever, but we appreciate a great deal of the work that you did. We understand the magnitude of it, the time and effort that went into it, and the specificity in your report is incredibly helpful. And I, I really believe that it's going to be looked at and used as a guide uh, to folks going forward. So thank both of you as well. And Dr. Whitley and Ms. McGinn, uh, when this whole series of hearings started, uh, we weren't too favorably disposed towards the department's attitude toward this, and that's nothing personal against Dr. Whitley because I think she had her work impeded. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez and others, I think, were horrible, uh, and I think they did things that they shouldn't have done. I think their attitude wasn't where it should be. 
on this issue. I am impressed uh, with both of you uh, with a sense of responsibility and desire to deal with this. I think we have ways to go, and I think your acknowledgement of that is comforting to us, uh, that you understand exactly what's going on here and that there's work to do and you seem quite willing to do it and to use the good resources that you've had at your disposal to get it done. I think I can speak for the rest of the committee on this. We appreciate that. It's not always been the case. It gives us a feeling that as we go forward, we don't have to have hearing after hearing after hearing to see whether or not the Department of Defense takes us seriously uh, on that. So good luck going forward on that. Thank you, everybody, for your work on that. I, I hope that the men and women in the service are somewhat comforted by the fact that you're on it, you're on the case, and you're working on it, and as a group, uh, we'll all take this as a, a joint challenge and move forward. Uh, thank you very much. At this point in time, I want to thank the witnesses on this panel, and we'll now receive testimony from our second panel before us, Mr. Merle Wilberding. Thank you, folks, for allowing Mr. Wilberding to take his seat. General. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Wilberding. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Merle Wilberding is an attorney with the law firm of Coolidge Wall in Dayton, Ohio. He represented Mary Lauterbach after the death of her daughter, Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach. He has previously worked with a number of additional families of victims of military sexual assault. He is also a retired captain in the United States Army, where he served in the Judge Advocate General Corps. Mr. Wilberding brings a, a JD, holds a JD from the University of Notre Dame. So I want to thank you, Mr. Wilberding, for coming here, making your time uh, to be, make yourself available for us and help us. I ask that you please stand. Just raise your right hand. And do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Wilberding, you have a statement, I understand. Your full statement will be put on the record, of course. But if you could tell us in five minutes generally uh, your points, your high points on that, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tierney, Congressman Blake, and members of the panel. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. I have submitted my written statement, and I'll keep a, give you a short summary right now. I'm Merle Wilberding. I'm an attorney from Dayton, Ohio. During the Vietnam War, I served as a captain in the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps. Since early January of 2008, I have represented Mary Lauterbach, the mother of Marine Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach, who had filed a claim of sexual assault against fellow Marine Corporal Cesar Lorian, only to be murdered six months later and buried in a shallow fire pit in Cesar Lorian's backyard. At a hearing before this subcommittee on July 31, 2008, Mary Lauterbach became the voice of her daughter as she shared the fears and harassment that Maria had endured after she had filed the sexual assault complaint. This afternoon I want to talk about the continuing stream of other victims and their families who have reached out to Mary and me. For me it started in the cemetery after Maria's funeral. I was approached by three or four women, all of whom told me that they had been victims of sexual assault in the military, and all of whom told me that their lives had never recovered. As time continued, the stories from other victims continued. In February, 
We had a call from a mother whose daughter had filed a sexual assault claim against a fellow soldier. My heart went out to her as she said, Maria's story could have been my daughter's story. The only difference between my daughter and Maria Lauterbach is that Maria is dead. In March, we had another call from a mother whose 19-year-old daughter had filed a sexual assault claim against a fellow soldier. Instead of receiving protection and programs to help her recover, she was haunted by the ostracism and disbelief of the fellow members of the unit. Meanwhile, the accused was treated with sympathy and deference as the case moved forward. In June, after the NBC Dateline aired a program on Mar Maria Lauterbach's case, we received a telephone call from a mother who had watched the program. Her 20-year-old daughter was a Marine who had just made a sexual assault claim. Now she feared for her life. She had a military victim advocate assigned to her, but the victim advocate told her that there wasn't really anything she could do for her. All of these stories were virtually identical. The complaining victim became isolated and harassed. Their lives were disoriented. The victim became the accused. The accused became the victim. Significantly, all of these victims were no longer effectively contributing to the mission of the military. I want to focus on victim advocates, or as I often call them, victim listeners. In every discussion I have had with victims and victims' families, the victim advocate was described as a very nice person who expressed her concern and understanding, but was not proactive and was not independent and either could not or was not able to do anything. In Maria Lauterbach's case, her victim advocate was her direct report within the chain of command. Consequently, her victim advocate had to think about her own efficiency reports, her own performance reviews, and her own obligations to the command. I have read the report of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault in the Military Services. There are recommendations to improve the victim advocate program, but I do not believe they go far enough. Victim advocates need, to, need the ability and the training to be more proactive. It is at these most critical times that the victim advocate must act. It is important to remember that these victims are often 18 to 21 years old, and at this point, very vulnerable, very much alone, and very much incapable of making good decisions. Victim advocates need clear authority to act independent of the command. Congress could, should consider establishing a line of authority for victim advocates that is outside the base chain of command. Are we making progress? I'm at the, the boots of the ground level. What I see is not progress. I've heard the testimony of the panel before and, and the difficulties of making progress and of measuring progress, and I accept their testimony for what it was. But I do not think we've done enough. We need to do more. Victims need a better protection system to survive sexual assaults in the military, and the military needs a better victim protection system to protect their own interest in continuing to have a uh, supportive and uh, healthy and active uh, military force. And thank you, and I'm open for any questions you have. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. Uh, why don't we start the question with Mr. Turner, who uh, was kind enough to make sure that your testimony was procured for us here today. Mr. Turner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again and also the Ranking Member Flake uh, for uh, allowing Mr. Wilberding to testify. Um, in, uh, in addition to uh, his work, obviously his perspective is, uh, with the Lauterbach family, his perspective is very helpful to us as he has reviewed the report uh, that uh, we had just received. Uh, I'd like to ask you, if I could, to enter into the record a, um, um, an op-ed piece that Mr. Wilberding has uh, written sexual assault in the military looking for a few good changes that has some of the recommendations that he had just without objection so ordered and um <coughs> i uh, wanted to ask mr wilberding in, in your did, when you um you began to represent the lauterbach family and the facts began to unfold um <coughs> you had a critical eye and ability to look at um where where things went wrong where the military and dod did things wrong um <coughs> and uh, and i've greatly appreciated that because it's been a, an a great assistance to me as we've looked to legislation that might be able to address some of the issues. But one thing I find really compelling about the story of your experience since uh, you began working with the Lauterbach family is that others have come to you. 
and they've come to you with their stories of their experience. Um, why do you think people are, have, are reaching out so and have been contacting you to tell you their stories also? Well, it's been an interesting process in, in the time period now, really two years from that. And people have called from all over the country. Um, the cases I cited here, uh, they were in military bases throughout the country. And each time what was consistent to me was that they had nowhere to turn to. They had no, their daughters in every case uh, uh, could not, did not have any uh, faith and trust in the victim advocate that they were dealing with. They didn't have any faith in the superiors dealing with. They were really struggling. And these are, for the most part, um, hardworking people who didn't have the money to go to the faraway places. In every instance, as their daughter was a very long distance from home. So there wasn't the support system for the daughter uh, from the home that you could have, for example, if a rape occurred in a college atmosphere, there are a lot of other ones. But in the military, it's different. And I think they were reaching out to us primarily because, one, they wanted to tell their story. I thought they, they really wanted to get the story out of the struggles and frustrations they were had. And two, I think they were looking for a support group to have them uh, reassure that, uh, uh, that thing people cared about them. I thought that was what I really felt is that they were so alone, their daughters were so alone, and they were getting no support from anyone in the military, and that's what they were reaching out for. Well, your recommendation on the victim advocates in the, uh, taking them from the chain of command, how will that allow them to be more proactive, and, and what, would that, well, what, what would that do to help us in, in the system? Well, I it's an interesting concept, and, and especially in the light of the conversation uh, from the panel, uh, earlier today, I, my initial thought had always been that when the Marines issued their statement on January 15th of 2008, remember that her body was found on Friday, January 11th, and at 3 o'clock the Marines issued a nine-page opening statement, they called it, that listed everything they had done and what struck me about it, and by the way, they read it to us, uh, I was in a conference room with Mary Lauderback, they read it to us. Uh, um, literally minutes before they walked in front and read it. So we had no opportunity to see it in advance and we're trying to take notes on it. But what struck me about that nine page opening statement was it was a series of statements as to providing some basis for why they didn't do what they had, uh, didn't uh, take things seriously, didn't take certain actions, didn't pursue her. Everything seemed to us that it looked like they were given reasons why they didn't do anything and why their guesses at that were, were reasonable guesses. And what struck me is there wasn't anything in there, gee whiz, we could have done more, we should have done more. Uh, it came across with not a mea culpa, but a Maria culpa. It really struck me as they were saying, well, nobody gave us all the hard evidence if you had just told me all that. And they're putting the burden on the on the accused to connect the dots, and there were a lot of red alerts in that. And what struck me about the conference and the panel earlier was that I, when the question was same, I asked, why wasn't it in the report? And the response was, they talked to the commanders. Uh, and I have a good appreciation for that uh, uh, and a good amount of respect for them, a great respect for them. When you talk to the commanders, it's like uh, the same situation to my reaction is the same as what I saw here. And it's the same as people in general. When people look at facts, they tend to look at it as reinforcing their own position. When institutions look at facts, they tend to look at the facts reinforcing their own position. So when the Marines looked at the Lauderback facts, they looked at it in the sense of, well, we did this, we did that, nobody told us about this, nobody told us about that. And that's what I heard, frankly, in my view of the commanding generals. Do we need an independent one? No, we, we're, we're doing a good job ourselves. And I, and I sort of sense that that's, that's how the, that's in part human nature and part institutional nature, but I think it's something to keep in mind as you evaluate those positions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Warbrink. Thank you. Well, where would the uh, line of authority lie to best ensure that independence? Well, that's a fair question and, and, a, and a reasonable opportunity as to whether or not there's uh, I recognize the suggestion that it should be a DOD employee if, if it's a civilian or a member of the military if it's a military victim advocate. Um, 
But I think that they talk about it, and I've been out of the Army for a number of years, but the Defense uh, Council and the military have a, has a, uh, has a separate chain of command that the prosecutors don't have, and they did that to create some independence in that. And in terms of that, why I think it's important, and, and Mil Maria's case is a good illustration, is the Marines gave their statement on January 15th, said, this is what happened, every fact is true, and nobody told us differently, and we obviously don't have any obligation to pursue it. But in doing that, they uh, didn't really look at uh, what had happened beforehand, and consequently things just fell by the wayside, and they didn't have a independent victim advocate saying, uh, it, particularly in that period, which, which should have been all the time, from May until December. She went missing on December 14th. The victim advocate could have been and should have been doing more things. But from December 14th to January 11th, to me, that's where an independent advocate could have been most helpful. You know, what about this evidence? So Mary Lauterbach and some other could have been in contact with her. Found this, found that. Why don't you do more? Yeah, I, I guess I get that aspect of it. I think it's a point well made. But but who to whom would that victim advocate report? I think they would have to create that system within the within the military. And what about the task force recommendation that there would be privileged communications between a, the advocate and the and the victim? Is that a good idea? I think that's a very good recommendation. I read the victim stories in appendix, in appendix F and uh, detailed the stories where uh, defense counsel for the accused had. Uh, essentially taken the depositions, called them as trial. I think that's a very good um, suggestion. We know that the Mr. Flake? Mr. Turner? Um, Sir, I want to thank you for coming all the way to make your suggestions. I appreciate you letting us put your article on the record. I think these are things that will help inform our decisions as we go forward, and particularly with uh, that one idea that certainly needs and warrants to be explored. So our, our appreciation. Thank you. Uh, with that, the, me the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.